I want to welcome everyone to our first uh, PNQSA webinar. We're going to be having these about qu quarterly, so make sure you join our email list if you would like to receive invitations to more of these or follow us on social media. And I just want to welcome everyone again. Um, and so just for a little background on PIANC, uh, it was founded back in 1885. It used to stand for Permanent International Association for Navigation Congresses, but it now is the uh, World Association for Waterborne Transport Infrastructure. And PIANC USA is the United States section for PIANC. And Today we are going to have expert from the Environmental Commission, but PIANC has four main technical commissions, Environment, uh, Inland uh, Navigation, Maritime Navigation, or, or Deep Draft Navigation, uh, which is our MARCOM, and we also have a Recreational Navigation Technical Group, which is RECCOM. So we will rotate our webinars to focus around those four technical areas, and as I mentioned, today's presentation will be on the Environmental Commission, and we have Victor Magar from Ramble, who was part of Working Group 176, and I am going to let uh, Victor introduce more on the Working Group report he's going to be speaking about. So I'm going to turn it over to Victor uh, to introduce yourself a little further. And thank you. Uh, the folks at PIANC for helping organize this and make this happen. Uh, so I'll start with a this presentation and I'll kind of run through the whole thing. Um, I think you all have the ability to communicate questions uh, during the process through texting if you want to send a text message. Rachel, will you be picking those up and then you can share those with me afterwards? You can read those aloud near the end as well. Right. Um, so we can go through those, or we'll have, I don't know if, well, this is, I think, um, uh, the first time PIANC is experimenting with this process and doing a live broadcast like this. So we'll all kind of learn the process together. Perhaps we'll have uh, an open questions where people can can talk into the mic too. So, um, uh, so thank you very much again for attending and your interest in this subject. The subject here being the the, the product that was produced by Working Group 176, which is a guide for applying working with nature to navigation infrastructure projects. That guide guidance document has been released by PIANC. It's available on their website. I think all of us that are members of PIANC can certainly go in and readily access that. Uh, certainly if you have any difficulty accessing that, there are uh, communications or opportunities to get that through the PIANC website if you're interested in this guidance document itself. I was the chair of that process and uh, have the, the, we had the pleasure of working with a variety of uh, really outstanding experts in the field representing various port authorities uh, globally, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, private consultants, and some um, uh, folks that are also involved in regulatory agencies or regulatory oversight. Uh, and, and that variety really helped to inform our, our approach to our thinking or how we were, what we wanted to communicate in this working with nature guidance. So thank you to all of those team members shown on that previous slide. So the remainder of this conversation, I'll go through a background of our working group goals. Uh, I'll talk about the framework and what we try to produce, and then I'll go through the, some details about the guidance, the scope and content of the guide, so you can understand what is contained within the guidance. Um, I'm not going to into a lot of detail about any of the all of the different subjects that are in the guide and look to you all to um, inform yourselves through the guidance to, but I'll, I'll give you a, an outline of the, the shape of the guidance so you understand what, what it contains. And then we'll go through some case studies. And the case studies were a very important component of this working with nature guide for us. So beginning with our background and goals, Really, we, we recognize what in NVCOM and for the Environmental Commission had recognized was emerging habitat needs in an intersection with infrastructure projects, with uh, the large navigation 
uh, transport infrastructure that Pianc has to manage. Uh, they were responding to, and we are all responding to, stakeholder and public pressure to reduce environmental burdens. And there was an interest in trying to align ourselves and align Pianc's vision with the Environmental Commission role that being led by Todd Bridges today in protecting and, and enhancing the natural environment. So uh, what we were, this, this kind of built to an idea of that there could be more innovation, more investment in natural resources and natural habitat, finding ways to integrate uh, projects that are dealing with navigation to integrate natural habitat into our thinking. You can see a photograph here to the right where the Port of Lahav is shown in the top right and an estuarine environment that was integrated with the port and some of their work in the middle lower left of the project. So that was a project that integrated uh, habitat restoration with the uh, port's expansion in the year 2000 or thereabouts. And then we are looking to look at ways of reducing or helping offset some costs. Some of those costs are associated with mitigation or uh, costs that we might encounter after the fact, after we implement a remedy. We're, our vision is that working with nature can hopefully conserve or protect, uh, conserve costs and, and reduce costs as well, if thought about uh, properly and, and effectively. Um, so finally, thinking of creating new habitat opportunities, that kind of circles back to our first point of recognizing these emerging, ha emerging habitat needs and, and what can we do to foster and create new habitat. So the, the, the goals were really to fundamentally to provide some technical information on and develop an approach for working with nature coming from building off of the terms of reference reference shown here on the right hand side of my uh, uh, of the uh, slide here um, describe relationships between some initiatives already in existence engineering with nature which is a substantial US Army Corps of Engineers initiative and building with nature an eco shape in initiative coming from the Netherlands so some of these concepts um, are not uh, are already in existence. We're not that new, but Pianc wanted to understand how does this fit within the world that Pianc deals with and Pianc's customers, Pianc's um, membership. So our goal was to give guidance on how to integrate working with nature into navigational in inf infrastructure projects and very importantly to provide some case studies for that work. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble moving. There we go. So our framework was as follows. We basically created a six-step process, one that may be very familiar to most of us of just thinking of good project management. Uh, we looked at the need to establish project needs and objectives very early in the project, particularly those needs and objectives relating to natural habitat a need to understand the environment that we're working in, uh, making meaningful use of stakeholder engagement is a theme that you'll see carried throughout this document because it was fundamental to working with nature that we bring in our stakeholders and make them a part of our understanding of the site, but also our vision for the changes that we're implementing that impact the communities, impact people, and impact the environment. Then we go through the, the steps four, five, and six, which really deal with design, build, and evaluate. So we have, uh, we design to the benefit of navigation and nature. Um, we build and implement the project, and then we will monitor and adapt. And we show this circular drawing that is familiar to many of us, especially when working with nature, the circularity of, of thinking and projects and the need to come back to, uh, to some of the same themes again and again stakeholder involvement or understanding the environment, everything, this is a very dynamic environment that is always in change and we need to learn from what we're doing and be able to adapt. 
Um, that is also reflected in this diagram that is, is really one of the core diagrams that we have in our document that kind of shows this project in a more stepwise fashion. Step one, again, establishing our project needs and objectives. We have uh, begin by organizing an, an integrate and um, a functional, multifunctional team with biologists, ecologists, and engineers, establishing objectives, both objectives, understanding the objectives of the primary infrastructure project, but also maybe some of the natural resource objectives, and performing data review, trying to understand the site. Understanding the environment, we have, you know, we, of course, we collect additional data. We might do physical, biological, chemical data, um, doing detailed assessments of habitat, trying to understand the environment that we're working in. Uh, and then we go to our uh, the project proposal and design process. We have a feasibility study. We identify win-win situations, which is an important theme that we believe that these are opportunities both to win in terms of better design, but also winning in terms of creating better habitat. And maybe a third win, which is helping to reduce costs. So we have these win-win-win opportunities uh, that working with nature can bring to an important project. And, uh, and then we prepare the design and, and align that with the existing environment. And then in, sec in, in five, we, we build and implement, selecting contractors, building the project, implementing, and so forth. It, it was very important to us to recognize, again, this comes back to that idea of circularity that, you know, we, we have a process of monitoring, evaluation, and ad adaptation as step six that carries through Pretty much when we're, you know, after we've established our objectives to understand the environment through design, through building. We often have pre-design work, for example, that might have monitoring components. When we're doing monitoring or evaluating the environment in phase two, the more we have a vision for what we want that environment to look like, some of those monitoring components can be reflected in the final monitoring when we're done. So we might want to do... Um, look at habitat quality or counting different species of a, in a particular habitat and then look at the impact or the improvement we might have associated with that, for example. And of course, the stakeholder engagement is something I show, we show here that carries through uh, the entire process um, from beginning to end. So, you know, we have, you know, of course, at the very earliest stages, we might want to make use of stakeholder engagement, certainly looking at reports or documents or objectives that we have for example, here in the United States, very much, very often communities have remedial action plans or various uh, vision documents that tell us uh, where what uh, various trustees or stakeholders want to see in the future environment, and we can build off of that information as well as engaging in direct uh, meetings and one-on-one -on -one contact with our stakeholders and trustees. So that tells us of the visions that we wanted, why, why we were here, what was, uh, what were the drivers for creating this working with nature guide, and the scope and content of that guide really builds on those six elements. So um, one of the themes that you'll see is an emphasis on no longer or moving away from this idea, and this comes back to this idea of circularity, moving away from the idea that we would just have a technical design, then we might have some mitigation requirements, and then we would look to an environmental impact statement in a very linear fashion, and then move from there to figure out uh, what it is that we need to do to mitigate some of the damage, but rather to try and more holistically integrate working with nature into our, our project thinking. So we're fish, trying to shift from responding and working against nature to working with nature. And there are some ways of working with nature, like um, mimicking nature, like we show in the pictures on the right, mimicking uh, a natural lagoon with uh, a constructed lagoon. Um, there's certainly ways of working with nature to improve or uh, work with the existing hydrodynamics. Uh, but, but our emphasis, in addition to those, which I think is probably self-evident to any you know, good engineer in this practice, we want to minimize some of the forces we're working against so our, our, our systems last longer and are more uh, resilient. But we're also looking at ways that we can enhance nature by 
this idea of these win-win solutions, protecting environment, but also creating perhaps new habitat and new environment in the process. We also ref ref um, reference, excuse me, uh, climate change and refer to uh, an existing or in progress uh, working group that's focused on climate change. We don't d delve too heavily into climate change, except to acknowledge that that is certainly a long-term vision when we're looking at habitat. If we're creating wetlands, for example, that can really add to resilience and help reduce vulnerability in shoreline environments. So there are opportunities where working with nature can be aligned very nicely with climate change. And we also align with ecosystem services objectives. So for those of you uh, perhaps less familiar with ecosystem services, it's a, it's a term of art that is used to, uh, to help quantify the services that the ecosystem provides, both in terms of human use and human function from recreational value to uh, water quality um, in a variety of different um, human use functions to um, ecological services, how they may benefit the environment. And so this is uh, an accounting of those services and, and quantification of those services. So by measuring those services, we can look at how our new infrastructure may be impacting the environment, but also how it might be improving. So you might have some negative impacts to the ecosystem services, but hopefully in the long run even more positive impacts to those services. We don't go through the mathematics or a lot of detail of ecosystem services, except to reference the ecosystem services work group, which when they complete their guidance, uh, if not already very close to complete, then um, that could be something that could really dovetail nicely in, or be read hand in hand with this guidance. Um, and then just structurally, we begin with an introduction, trying to introduce who is our intended audience. You see on the right-hand side of this figure, this slide, um, an image of the guidance as it was finalized. We go into background, which is much of the information that I've just provided in this conversation uh, up until now. We go through um, understanding the context. When does ecos when does working with nature work? When should we be thinking about that? How should we be bringing it into context for our projects, uh, and, and trying to provide context for different kinds of projects that we might encounter, from port redevelopment, deepening navigation channels, or any of the variety of, of uh, infrastructure topics that Pianc needs to manage. And then we go through the framework, and the framework really takes each of those six elements that I just described a few slides ago, and then puts a narrative to each one and describes how that would be implemented. Finally, ending with working with nature case studies. Uh, you'll notice, as those of you on this call, that we, we really didn't focus on the, the more technical aspects, these are perhaps more of the governance aspects of a project. It's really a project management, project uh, control thinking. How are we bringing and integrating nature projects, nature resiliency into our thinking and into our work? Now, one of the reasons for that is that the, each site is so uniquely complex and there's quite a wealth of information that tells us, for example, about hydrodynamics. So, you know, we want we, we have a couple examples that show how working with nature worked with hydrodynamics, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about the technical side of the hydrodynamic process and how we should work with nature. We find, think that is relatively self-evident to most good engineers in practice. Um, really that what it becomes unique is, is how this impacts nature and how we can bring nature into our decision making. Uh, but um, that, that's why you see the, the kind of structure around how to focus on working with nature, maybe a little less on how to do these projects, but that's also where the case studies become very important to us. And we'll talk about the case studies now. They are important because they give real-world examples of working with nature. 
all of those case studies were developed before we developed the guidance. So we don't really have the benefit of having the guidance and then implementing that guidance in case studies. When we talk about case studies here, we're talking about, by example, how have how has nature been brought into other projects so that people can learn from that and get a, a real flavor for the, the different opportunities that may exist on our own projects. And I'll talk about five and then go through fairly quickly through the creation of wetlands for new habitat. And um, that's the, um, the Port of La Havre, an in-river sediment placement pro project by the Corps of Engineers, uh, some in-water placement at the Port of Oakland, uh, stabilization and upland placement, which is done by my company, Ramble in Finland uh, and elsewhere, and um, leveraging new infrastructure for a new tunnel and the vision for bringing nature into that very substantial tunnel project. So for the Port of La Havre, uh, this is perhaps the more detailed of all of these case studies. In the year 2000, there was a, a port expansion, it was called Port 2000, Paul Scherer, our um, uh, our, our member and mentor for, for the Working with Nature Working Group and one of the, the leaders of this concept who helped develop the original uh, terms of reference. Paul had led this work and one could go back to Paul. Any of you can go back in for more information. On the upper right shows the port expansion. The lower right uh, shows some an image of habitat creation and uh, habitat improvement that was integrated with the port. About 3,500 meters of heavy duty keys and, keys and bulkheads for uh, vessels of 16 plus meters in draft, uh, um, draft for port expansion. Uh, about, it included about 900 million uh, public and 600 million euros of private funds. Um, and it included a commensurate move toward more restoration of the Seine estuary, uh, which included about 50 million euros of uh, funds that went into this habitat restoration component. And that included some, uh, a new environmental challenge channel that was developed to protect the wetland. That's what you see at the bottom right. The building of some bird resting areas and uh, nesting areas and some hydromorphological modeling of the estuary to help protect the, the estuary and understanding the flow of sediment within the estuary. And so they went through, and, and it really, in, in retrospectively, Paul helped us go through the six, um, the six step process. And we did this with all the case studies. We kind of looked backwards and said, how did these fit into the six step process that we created? So you can see how those steps might be realized in new and future projects if you're using this guidance. And uh, so they looked at the project needs and, and recognizes the, the need for the port expansion, but as well as the need for uh, habitat conservation. They did a lot of environmental studies through the 1990s, including some hydromorphological modeling of the estuary. Um, they brought in stakeholders through the 1990s. That was a very important component of their work to understand stakeholder needs and special attention to fishermen and other estuarine user, users. Uh, and then they also prepared a design that looked at some uh, unique components that were very interesting, uh, some morphological dredging outside of the port, which you're seeing here that is dealing with managing sediment transport. So what you see on the right-hand side are some hydrologic model results that are showing some potential scour areas. And that material could have been carried up and downstream in the Seine, which was um, undesirable in terms of some sediment loading concerns. So uh, they, had, um, uh, they had included um, some extra dredging of about three and a half million meters of material to prevent that transport from occurring. Um, so that's an example of working with nature where we're trying to really continue to protect nature in addition to some of the habitat creation that they included in their project. Uh, and then they went to build and implement. They reused about 26 million meters of material um, as fill for the port facility. So that was a very 
good beneficial reuse of existing material and they continue to they sequence the construction to help protect the environment and they continue to monitor and they're monitoring for about 10 years. Um, so a really nice example that comes out in the document and you can read more detail or you have email addresses or contact information from this document, you can reach out to Paul for more information on, on uh, the, the large complexity of that project. The next project comes from a uh, bend in a river, the Atchafalaya River in Horseshoe Bend in Louisiana, led by the Corps of Engineers, at the um, Engineer Research and Development Center, and Burton Sudell, who is a member of our group. And their problem, they had uh, this, you see this kind of island in this uh, old image, this island had, had mostly been disappearing and they had a, a real burden of dredging sediment in this area. So the concept came in to redevelop this island and redirect flows and perhaps increase the flow velocity at the same time, adding habitat, improving hydrodynamics. As you might see here, we have um, a little bit of faster velocities now in the inside curve of this bend with the island present and an opportunity to lessen the amount of dredging required around this bend and add new habitat. And this has been very successful and there's a number of papers that have been written about this, but in this, in this cluster of images, of eight images from left to right and top to bottom, you can see the island being formed over time to really being quite substantial and self-sustaining in this last uh, figure bottom where I'm pointing. And you've got uh, they, the, the dredging team had placed material in this island, um, helped stimulate the natural sedimentation and growth to, as I mentioned, to become a more self-sustaining uh, island. There's also much less dredging that ends up need, being needed. And some of the metrics of this are included in the in the uh, Working with Nature document, but to the extent that the flow velocities here in the inside bend are much faster. In fact, as I understand from, from the team, this uh, path that you see, the navigation channel going around the island, now cuts inside the island, which has also shortened the amount of, uh, shortened the distance of travel saved on fuel and as I mentioned, less than the amount of dredging. Meanwhile, creating a beautiful island habitat that you see in the top left picture, which has um, been adding a lot of ecosystem improvement to the environment. My third case study in the Port of Oakland, this was uh, presented by Ellen Chonk. This actually won the award for the best working with nature project uh, at the most recent World Congress in Panama, and Ellen was there to receive that award. And you see these images from left, an older image in 1993 to the right in 2016. The one to the right shows a lot of land changes, the green space that is now used as a park and some habitat. So there's a, a human use component and an ecological component that you can see in some of the mud flats that are created and that are emerging at low tide on the right-hand picture. And what we see here are a list of different functions that this project included. The Middle Harbor Enhancement Area, that's the marsh area, included shallow grass habitat, eelgrass, salt marsh, bird roosts, and, and fish habitat, um, to name uh, some of the functions that are uh, were brought into the, by this project. Um, and then the Middle Harbor Shoreline Park that you see outlined in green around the perimeter um, involved public access, uh, bike walk paths and bay views and views of the infrastructure associated with the Port of Oakland. So a really nice repurposing of that portion of the port where a lot of the, the, the keys and the, the bulkheads were relocated to another part of, in, in, part of the port and also more consolidated allowing this um, area to be freed up for some human and habitat uses. Um, and and there, here are some metrics of what they went through. Going through the project goals, um, trying to reuse about five to six million car yards of material, working with community advisory groups and the Habitat Advisory Council to uh, understand the environment as well as doing a number of different tests 
to understand the environment and engaging stakeholders throughout this process. Stakeholders were very heavily involved in the process. Um, to lead to this uh, implementation of the project where the first phases have been completed, it is in prog progress. They continue to do subsequent phases, more eelgrass planting, uh, more sediment placement, and they are in a monitoring phase to monitor the environmental improvement. And that is a really nice example we'll see here over time with that feedback loop where we can adapt, monitor, and adapt, and return and improve our environmental changes. Um, just to give you some context, this is about a $67 million project that included about almost $60 million spent and about $9 million more to be spent. Uh, in the in the port of Chakasari and Vusari, these are ports in Finland. Uh, they're heavily redeveloped areas. The, it, the photograph that you see here is one of an old industrial port that is now repurposed as uh, commercial and public housing and also included a great deal of sediment reuse. Um, we are now leading in, uh, I'm, I'm co-chairing for the Beneficial Use Working Group, um, Working Group 214, a focus on beneficial use. So I won't spend too much time here, but beneficial reuse of sediment is a, a fantastic way of rethinking, repurposing uh, the, the valuable product that we get from sediment and thinking of working with nature. Less energy use associated with transport, uh, finding less need for perhaps uh, clean material, um, very expensive material at times to be have, to have to be brought in for fill and being able to use the sediment if it can be stabilized and if it's not contaminated or in this case, as you see here, where contaminants were actually stabilized. Um, I don't show the results, but we have them where they did a lot of work on the structural analysis of the material to make sure it could be reused for its purposes, as well as the chemical analyses that show that this was uh, didn't have a potential to leach into the environment after uh, leaching chemicals in the environment after stabilization. And you just see some design drawings at the bottom showing different areas of these lagoons in the top left that, that were stabilized in different ways that could show um, different, stable, different mixed designs that might be appropriate for different portions of the um, stabilized conditions or the, the sediment that was being stabilized. And then the top right, an overburden that was placed to help improve the stability functionality of the, uh, the cement, fly ash, um, oil shell ash stabilization processes. And we were using, we've used this material then to, in this case, to develop a noise barrier and using about 30,000 cubic meters of material that would otherwise have been transported as waste material to design a 5 to 13 meter noise barrier for this community. Um, other functions of this have included landfill cap cover, land, uh, various parks, um, noise barriers and a variety of functions that anyone can, I think, imagine and creatively think of that could be used with uh, sediment material that does not have a risk of leaching contaminants into the environment, but provides some structural fill material for a variety of land uses. And I end with the Furman Belt Fixed Link Project. This is a future thinking project this is a project that uh, that includes a tunnel going from Denmark to Germany, Germany to Denmark, um, cutting off a substantial uh, transit pathway uh, to connect these two countries and involving a great deal of stakeholder involvement. This is a project that is still under design and concept. They had considered a suspension bridge a bored tunnel where we would one would dig a core, a boring uh, through the uh, and underwater, or in the case of the remedy that was selected here, an immersed tunnel that involved first dredging a channel, reusing that dredge material, placing the tunnel inside the dredge channel, 
and that helped avoid a lot of obstructions that would be associated with a bridge, had a lot of environmental benefits, um, and as well as uh, a lot of cost and uh, energy benefits. So you see an image of that here, uh, and we have um, the, the top left image shows how the, this area would be dredged, the tunnel would be placed inside, and then material would be placed on top to weigh it down, to lock it in place, as well as to create a protective layer and some new habitat. And in the bottom image, we see an area where a lot of this material will be reused on the Danish side as it, as it happens uh, for a variety of reasons of where this material could be used most beneficially for the environment. Um, and um, just a couple of things, that, uh, a couple of metrics. This would be the, the largest fixed link in Europe. It would be about 18 kilometers long to a depth of about 30 me meters. Lots of stakeholder engagement, conversations with local stakeholders, lo the public, as well as bringing both governments together to be able to uh, realize this project. And th that kind of stakeholder engagement is happening in real time as we speak. Uh, and this last image just shows how some of these, this material may be used uh, to benefit the environment from creating some protective areas for the entrance to the tunnel in the middle, some beaches and protected lagoons that will be created, an exposed beach here off to the left, um, some uh, a natural lagoon, and rethinking re re some unprotected cliff areas that have some erosion and trying to protect some of the erosion of those cliff areas. There was a really nice article that, uh, our, that the team had put together in Terra et Aqua, which all of you, I hope, are, have access to. And that tells about the, all of the metrics that goes in, go into this, as well as there's a case study of this in our document. So I realized I went fairly quickly through those case studies. I really was hoping to give you a flavor of what's happening. I know that I've probably been longer than we, than we anticipated, but there are still, I think there is still room in this hour for questions. You know, we really believe that this op working with nature provides an opportunity for planners and engineers to think about uh, natural processes, working with natural processes, integrating them into design, or integrating them adjacent to the design to be able to help manage our increasingly scarce, scarce habitat. Um, we have increasing demands on natural resources, so we have to be thinking more creatively on how we can continue to improve habitat and create new habitat and learn from each other and learn from project examples like those that I showed you. Um, thank you very much for joining this talk, and I'd be happy to answer questions. All right. Thank you, Victor. Uh, and this is, again, this is Rachel Grandpry speaking. I'm the, the Secretary for PNQ USA. You feel free to chat in your questions to me, or you can chat them in to the entire group. We have the chat line open. And I see one question so far, Victor. It's uh, from um, someone that they said they, they haven't noticed the use of the word sustainability. Uh, have they missed it, or was it a conscious decision to not include it in this context? No, it, it is included, and we do refer to sustainability issues, and, and thank you for that question. Yeah, that is a, a very important theme. We don't spend a lot of time going through sustainability metrics. Um, that, that, you know, that itself is an art that requires a lot of thought, and even to this day still has some challenges and on how we are measuring sustainability, whether sustainability reflects resilience and permanence or sustainability in helping improve the environment. We hope that to some degree, integrating nature or bringing nature into our work, it, there is a, an element of which it's self-evident that it is sustainable. It is a more sustainable approach than the approach that we've been using to date, which uh, we don't mean in, in a critical way, but it, which is really construct, implement, and then look at the environment and see uh, what we need to do to respond to that, um, those, uh, that construction or those changes. So by its nature, you could think this document really is trying to promote 
a more sustainable approach. Um, but we do mention it, but um, not with a lot more emphasis than I just described. All right, thank you, Victor. And for those of you who aren't able to chat uh, or text chat into the chat, uh, you can unmute your line by pressing star six if you wish to ask a question over the phone. Uh, so you would just press star six on your phones to become unmuted, uh, or you can text into the chat if there's any other questions. So uh, does anyone else have any questions for Victor? And I'm not seeing any ch uh, text in uh, into our chat. Uh, I'm going to take a moment, but uh, I'll leave uh, the chat line open if anybody wants to speak up. And I might take the screen uh, back over, Victor, so I can show people where they can find the this report. Oh, that's great. So yeah, thank you. So I'm Go going ahead. to share my screen. Hold on a second. It might take me a minute to set it up. And our, our hope is really to create a report that you all could use or leverage w with your stakeholders, with your group, helping to inspire the working with nature opportunities that you might want to realize for your project. So um, that would be a, a really nice outcome or a nice way that you all may be able to use it. All right, so everyone, this is uh, I'm at pink.org. I've clicked into publications, and uh, you can scroll to the bottom for our different technical types of publications. And if you click on NVCOM, which is our Environmental Commission uh, technical reports, you can find the links on where you can download this report. So Environmental Commission Working Group 176 showing right up here near the top. You can choose to buy the report individually, but what I would recommend is join PNQ USA because then you have access to all of the, the technical, re technical reports on PNQ.org. And so it's a much better deal if you are interested in looking at multiple reports. And to join PNQ USA if you're in the United States, but otherwise if you're in another country, you can join through your country's national section. PNQ USA has a website at pnq.us, and there's information on how to join uh, on our website there. And in addition, you can also, if you're interested in participating on other working groups, such as this one, we have a lot of active working groups where we're, we have openings for U.S. representatives to uh, participate on, on some of these new working groups. So go visit our website under News and Events. There's a list of working group vacancies, and you can review the terms of reference, and uh, perhaps it's an area that you have expertise. And we also welcome young professionals on these working groups as well. So if you're under 40, you can participate as a young professional. So you don't have to necessarily be an expert to participate. Uh, please also consider checking out our, our PNC newsletter to also or, or subscribe by contacting us up here at the top and asking to join our email list so you can hear about everything going on with PNQ USA. We have conferences, including the upcoming Ports 2019 conference in mid-September and the Smart Rivers conference coming up in late September. So check back on the website, download our newsletter, and uh, keep up to date on new publications and new new events happening. Again, we're going to have these webinars quarterly, and the next one, uh, we don't have it scheduled yet, but we're planning on it taking place in November, and it will be on the Recreation Commission. We'll be delivering that presentation, so please join our email list or follow us on, on social media so that you can, can hear when that announcement is posted or check back on our website. Uh, and again, we'll also be posting the recording of this webinar. So if you know someone that would be interested in this and they missed it today, we will be providing that out. We will uh, also post it on our website and social media. So please check back for that. And I'm going to look back into our chat to see if we've had some more messages. Okay, so there's been another question. Uh, with the project mentioned in the presentation, is the micro and macro biota considered during accessing the health of the habitats? Um, yes, 
I, I think that uh, absolutely, and and it really would be project specific. So some more um, uh, some more macro, you know, the the description of the Sen, the Sen estuary, for example, I think would have perhaps both, but a, a large focus on the macrobiota, thinking of birds and habitat and and plants and mm -hmm. other um, functions that that those estuaries may have. Uh, uh, you know, similarly, uh, I think all of them probably maybe uh, maybe more of a focus that we've had on the macrobiota. Again, as I is for just understanding that question, thinking of as I said, the birds and other animals that might use these areas for habitat, uh, plants, trying to manage invasives, trying to manage uh, the the appropriate plant structure to be able to support that wildlife. But to the extent that the you know, uh, benthic biota are also a concern. Um, there are benthic con community studies are not uncommon for these kinds of projects to try and make sure that we are supporting or creating a food source, creating an, uh, an environment that really can support a full range of biota. Um, so I, I don't have the details on each one, but those would be pretty common themes for any uh, project like this. All right, thank you, Victor. We had, uh, let's see, another question to the chat. Will the re recording be shared via email? Yes, if you registered for this webinar, we will be sending out a link on where to find the recording. And it will probably be sent some point this week. I don't have an exact time frame for me. It will depend on how long it takes us to upload it. Any other final questions? And remember, you can unmute your lines by clicking star 6. Oh, it looks like there was another message. Hold on. Uh, so from Christian DeMeyer, I remember being a founder of EnvyCom in 1990. That environmental protection, resilience, and sustainability were the cornerstones of this commission's objective. So that's not really a question. It's more of a comment. Thank you, Christian. That continues under today's leadership with with Todd and, and the entire commission that's very much focused on those themes, environmental protection, resiliency, sustainability. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating, and especially thank you, uh, Victor, for giving us this great presentation. It will be posted online. So again, if you uh, want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues, please, we welcome you to do so. Check back on our website and social media for for the updates. And we'll again, we'll email it out as well. And just reminding everyone, check back on our newsletter and our homepage for other big announcements from PA. For example, if you're a young professional under 40, we have an abstract deadline right now for the, the Pop Villains Award, and there's a cash prize for that. And so we're encouraging young professionals to submit abstracts, and the deadline is the end of uh, August. So you still have a little time, but not much. So please check back for more info on our website at pianc.us. And again, it's pianc.org for the international site where you can download the publications once you are a member or if you'd like to buy just the single copies. And can I add one more thing? I was sure. remiss and maybe not mentioning. Um, Rachel, you remind me that Pianc also maintains a database of working with nature projects. And we strongly encourage our members to add their projects to that database, which comes with it if it goes through it goes through a pretty critical evaluation process to make sure it really represents the the themes of working with nature that are important to us, important to Pianc. And if it does, you get a certificate of um, acknowledgement that Pianc has recognizes your that excuse me Pianc recognizes your project as working with nature. There's also an opportunity for the Working with Nature Award, which comes in uh, at the Congress, at the International Congress every four years. And uh, so we would encourage all of you who have projects like this to think about adding your project online to that database. All right, thanks, Victor. And uh, last thought as well, I'm up here on pianc.org. There's, uh, if you click into the Environmental Commission page, there's a link for more 
on working with nature, and there's a working with nature LinkedIn is LinkedIn group. PNQ USA also has a, a LinkedIn group as well. If you want to follow both, and it looks like there's a lot more information here on the Working with Nature Award flyers, our booklet, and uh, other links that you can check out to to learn more. There's also a press release you can download for uh, environmental. Uh, working group, Envycom Working Group 176 to share with others as well. So feel free to check that out as well. And I'll do one final check in the chat. Looks like we might have had one more. Um, we just got to thank you for a very interesting webinar. And yeah, on top of that, please feel free to contact us on our website with more feedback. Again, this is our first webinar like this. So uh, anything you'd like to see different uh, or continue to do in our next webinar. Please send your feedback in, and we thank you all for participating.